From Pacifica, this is Democracy Now! So now Republicans in Congress face a simple choice. Are they willing to compromise to protect vital investments in education and health care and national security and all the jobs that depend on them? Or would they rather put hundreds of thousands of jobs and our entire economy at risk just to protect a few special interest tax loopholes that benefit only the wealthiest Americans and biggest corporations. That's the choice. Washington's word of the month is sequestration. Automatic $85 billion in spending cuts slated to take effect March 1st, unless Congress reaches a deal. What do those cuts mean for the poor, unemployed, sick, and children? Then, don't bring war to campus. That's the message of students and alum at Yale University opposing the Pentagon funding of a proposed new research center on campus to train special operations forces in interview techniques. But first, we speak to Democracy Now! Sharif Abokadus, just back from Bahrain, where the U.S.-backed monarchy continues to crack down on pro-democracy activists. All that and more coming up. Welcome to Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. Republican Senator Lindsey Graham's revealed he says uh, the death toll in U.S. drone war overseas. At a speech in South Carolina Wednesday night, Graham said, quote, we've killed 4,700. Sometimes you hit innocent people, and I hate that, but we're at war, and we've taken out some very senior members of al-Qaeda, he said. Graham's comments mark the first time a U.S. official has offered a figure for those killed in nearly a decade of U.S. drone strikes abroad. The 4,700 figure matches the high end of an estimate by the Bureau of Investigative Journalism, which has extensively covered the strikes and faced a concerted U.S. government effort to discredit its work. The news comes as the Obama administration continues to stonewall members of Congress on fully releasing the Justice Department memos explaining the legal rationale for targeted killings overseas. The White House agreed to at least partially disclose the memos earlier this month after a Senate uproar amidst the confirmation hearings for CIA nominee John Brennan. But The New York Times now reports the administration's adopted a strategy of continuing to deny senators full access while simultaneously negotiating with Republicans to reveal more information on the deadly U.S. consulate in Benghazi, Libya. The strategy appears focused on ensuring the White House has enough votes for Brennan's confirmation while continuing to keep details of its assassination program under wraps. The Pentagon's notified its 800,000 civilian employees of likely furloughs should automatic spending cuts kick in at the end of the month. The military will lose $46 billion in funding unless President Obama and congressional Republicans can resolve their latest budget standoff by March 1st. In a speech at the University of Virginia Wednesday, Secretary of State John Kerry warned the looming sequester could threaten U.S. diplomacy overseas. Now, I'm particularly aware that in many ways the greatest challenge to America's foreign policy today is in the hands not of diplomats, but of policymakers in Congress. It is often said that we cannot be strong at home if we're not strong in the world. But in these days of a looming budget sequester that everyone actually wants to avoid, or most, we can't be strong in the world unless we are strong at home. My credibility as a diplomat working to help other countries create order is strongest when America at last puts its own fiscal house in order. And that has to be now. We'll have more on the sequester later in the broadcast. At least 31 people have reportedly been killed in a car bombing in Syria's capital, Damascus. The attack apparently targeted the headquarters of Syria's ruling Ba'ath Party. Most of the dead were civilians, with many more wounded. The United Nations says civilian casualties in Afghanistan have declined for the first time in six years. At least 2,754 Afghan civilians were killed in 2012, a drop of 12 percent. George Edge Gagnon, director of human rights for United Nations Assistance Mission in Afghanistan, linked the decline to less attacks by both militants and the U.S.-led NATO occupation. Ground engagements between the parties caused fewer casualties. There was a decline in suicide attacks by anti-government elements. There was a reduced number of aerial operations by international military forces, and there was measures taken 
by both the Afghan forces and the international forces to reduce harm to civilians. They actually made a change, we think, based on much of our efforts and the efforts of other Afghans to work with them to minimize civilian harm. Human Rights Watch is warning Mexico's enduring what it calls, quote, the most severe crisis of enforced disappearances in Latin America in decades. In a new report, Human Rights Watch says around 150 people and maybe hundreds more have disappeared at the hands of Mexico's police and military during the six-year drug war. At least 60 of the abduction cases raise questions of police collusion with the drug cartels they're purporting to fight. Human Rights Watch is calling on the Mexican government to investigate each case and establish a thorough process for documenting deaths and disappearances. According to one government estimate, some 70,000 people have died in Mexico's drug war since it was declared in 2006. President Obama has reportedly decided on his second-term nominees to head the Environmental Protection Agency and Department of Energy. Reuters reports Obama's tapped air quality expert Gina McCarthy to replace Lisa Jackson at the EPA. McCarthy currently serves as assistant administrator for the EPA Office of Air and Radiation. The nuclear physicist Ernest Moniz, meanwhile, is reportedly the pick to head the Energy Department. A former Undersecretary of Energy under President Clinton, Moniz currently heads the Energy Initiative at MIT. The group Food and Water Watch has started a petition against his potential bid, citing his support for the gas drilling process known as hydraulic fracturing, or fracking. Virginia lawmakers have approved a new measure imposing strict requirements for photo ID at the polls. The bill would force voters to produce government-issued documents, such as a driver's license, passport or a voter ID card, in order to cast their ballots. Although Republican Governor Bob McDonnell is expected to sign the measure into law, the Justice Department will have to sign off on its adoption. The Voting Rights Act mandates federal oversight of voting laws in states with a history of disenfranchising African Americans. The FBI has launched a probe of potential insider trading in the purchase of the food giant H.J. Hines, a consortium of the firms 3G Capital and Warren Buffett's Berkshire Hathaway acquired Hines for $28 billion earlier this week. The FBI says a number of suspicious trades took place one day before the deal was announced. Former Democratic Congress member Jesse Jackson Jr. has formally pled guilty to spending more than $750,000 in campaign funds on personal items. Jackson used donations for purchases, including music memorabilia and items for his home. He resigned last year after a several month leave to seek treatment for bipolar disorder. Outside the courtroom, defense attorney Reed Weingarten said Jackson's condition is improving and expressed hope his record of public service will factor into his sentencing. It turns out that Jesse has serious health issues. Many of you know about them. For, we're going to talk about them extensively with the court. And those health issues are directly related to his present predicament. That's not an excuse. That's just a fact. And Jesse's turned the corner there as well. And I think there's reason for optimism here, too. And finally, I would say we're hopeful and we expect that there'll be fairness in the process. And a person who has contributed so much to his community, done so much for so many people, will and should get credit for it. Former Congress member Jesse Jackson Jr. will be sentenced in June. Under his plea deal, he faces up to five years in prison. The Pentagon's launched a probe into a recent magazine interview with the Navy SEAL who reportedly killed Osama bin Laden. Speaking to Esquire magazine, the unidentified SEAL claims he lost medical benefits for himself and his family after recently leaving the Navy. The article quotes him saying, My health care for me and my family stopped at midnight Friday night. I asked if there was some transition from my TRICARE to Blue Cross Blue Shield. They said, No, you're out of the service. Your coverage is over. Thanks for your 16 years, unquote. He goes, goes on to use an expletive to describe the Navy's attitude toward his well-being. Navy commanders have pushed back against the SEAL's claims, saying he knowingly retired years before becoming eligible for additional benefits. Military investigators are looking into whether the interview divulged classified information about the raid on bin Laden's Pakistan compound. 
An Oscar-nominated Palestinian filmmaker has spoken out a day after being detained and questioned at Los Angeles International Airport, along with his family. Imad Bernard arrived in Los Angeles to attend this Sunday's Academy Awards, where he's nominated in the Best Documentary category for Five Broken Cameras. The film documents the growth of a Palestinian resistance movement to the Israeli separation wall in the West Bank village of Belin. Bernat and his family were freed after the filmmaker Michael Moore sent out Twitter messages and called lawyers to intervene. Bernat and Moore discussed the incident at an event Wednesday night. When I got here like, yesterday, I, uh, it was, you know, it was different uh, treatment and uh, different, you know, they, they were questioning me and they are, were asking for uh, uh, more documents and more papers. I had the visa, I had the documents and I had the, uh, the invitation, I had everything, but they were asking me for, to give them more uh, documents. So then I, I called the uh, head of the Academy, who then called the Academy's lawyer, who then got an immigration lawyer, all within five minutes. And uh, and then I called a friend uh, that uh, works in the State Department. And um, and uh, I'd say probably a half hour or so later, uh, they released him. You can go to our website at democracynow.org to see the interviews with the directors and subject of the films nominated for an Oscar this year, including Imad Bernat. That's democracynow.org. And that are some of the headlines. This is Democracy Now!, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. And I'm Juan Gonzalez. Welcome to all of our listeners and viewers around the country and around the world. Thanks so much for watching this report from Democracy Now!, your daily independent global news hour. We don't accept advertising or corporate funding, but rather rely on donations from viewers like you. Please make your contribution by visiting democracynow.org. We need your support today to keep bringing you this hard-hitting, in-depth reporting.